Good morning, 10th grade history class. Welcome back. This is our lesson number two of our online lesson plans that we're going to be posting up over the next couple weeks. Now, yesterday was our first lesson. We started talking about chapter 23. Uh, we began in section one talking about the rise of communism. Hopefully, everybody had those uh, dark colored notes copied down already. And so today, we're going to be starting on the second section of chapter 23. Now, before I get started, I do want to remind you all that you all had some homework last night. Your homework last night should have been chapter 23 timeline. Hopefully, everybody's been working on that. If you have finished your chapter 23 timeline, please, please remember to go ahead and turn that in and give it to your parents so they can go ahead and bring it into school and I can grade it for you and then record it into your Jupiter grades. Some of you guys have already been turning in some of your work and I do appreciate that. Just make sure that you're staying on top of that. So once you have your notes from yesterday and your timeline completed, we can go ahead and start on the lesson for today. Today we're going to be going over the second section of chapter 23. The first section of chapter 23 talked about the rise of communism. Second section of chapter 23 is going to talk about the first communist country. Of course, that's be the USSR or former Russia as we know it. Uh, Russia becomes the first fully communist country. Uh, in 1922 when the creation of the Soviet Union is created but there is going to be other countries that also become communist and there's still even communist countries in the world today now before we talk about Russia as a communist country let's talk a little bit about Russian history Russian history began in Eastern Europe uh, in the early 1200s there was a Viking tribe called the Rus who settled in Eastern Europe uh, they are a Slavic people and they settled in what is present-day Ukraine in a town called Kiev. Kiev, of course, is the capital of the Ukraine today, and this is how they earned the nickname the Kievan Rus. Um, in 1240, the Mongols, which swept from the east and came uh, towards Europe uh, all the way up to the Danube River, where Germany is today in Poland, actually defeated the Kievan Rus, and the Mongols were able to actually conquer this area and claim it for themselves. Uh, they ruled the Kievan Rus for about 250 years, and eventually one of the uh, local Kievan Rus, his name is Ivan III, he will eventually rise up against the Mongols as the Prince of Muscovy and uh, take over the territory that had been lost. Uh, the uh, Principality of Muscovy, or the city of Moscow, becomes very prominent at this time. Kiev and Moscow are essentially the two biggest Slavic cities at this time. They're centers of trade and commerce. And so this is where he's able to gain his support. So in 1480, uh, the Mongols are driven out of this territory and Ivan is declared a national hero. He's the first great national uh, king of United Russia and thus he earns the nickname Ivan the Great. Now Ivan the Great has a grandson and his grandson's name is Ivan the fourth this is probably the Ivan that you've probably heard of or have remembered from previous classes he is the uh, Ivan known as Ivan the terrible or Ivan Grozny he's the guy that is the first Russian king to adopt the nickname Tsar C-Z-A-R which essentially means uh, uh, Caesar in Russian another word for Caesar is Emperor so he essentially is the first Russian king that goes around calling himself Emperor or Tsar Ivan the fourth or Ivan the terrible he's known as Ivan the terrible because he's very ruthless uh, unscrupulous he uh, even murders his own son and his own uh, grandson and and daughter-in-law and so he is uh, very prone to anger and outbursts and things like that uh, eventually uh, a guy by the name of Mikhail Romanov will rise up to the throne and he will begin what's known as the Romanov line of kings or the Romanov dynasty which lasts from 1613 all the way up till about 1917 so almost, or a little bit over 300 years and it's going to end with one of his relatives Nicholas II being executed the greatest of the Russian czars is a guy by the name of Peter the Great uh, Peter the Great uh, loves Western culture he embraces uh, Western military tactics he even creates a Russian Navy on the uh, North Sea or on the Baltic in order to open up Russia to the Atlantic Ocean he actually has to defeat his rival in the region which is Sweden and he defeats Sweden in a series of battles and the territory that he takes from Sweden he will eventually create the city 
of St. Saint Petersburg in honor of himself. St. Petersburg will become the seat of government and the capital of Russia for about 300 years after this, and then eventually it'll move back to Moscow where it is today. Another great empress of uh, Russia's history is Katharina the Great. Uh, Catherine, uh, she is actually a German princess who marries, his, who marries the Russian uh, Tsar Peter II, but he uh, turns up dead all of a sudden uh, shortly after she arrives in Russia. And she eventually will become the empress herself, the Tsarina. She rules from 1762 to 1796. And like Peter, she is infatuated with Western culture. She dresses in Western clothing. She adopts Western ideas of enlightenment. She reads Voltaire and Rousseau. Uh, she, in the beginning, likes the French Revolution, likes what it stands for, uh, but will later on kind of see it as a threat to her power and will kind of push away from it a little bit more. But she is kind of forward thinking and wants to kind of push Russia into the modern age. She expands Russia's borders, uh, winning several uh, uh, territories along uh, Poland's border and the southern border with Turkey uh, near the Black Sea and the Crimea. And so she expands the size of her empire and thus she is remembered as Catherine the Great for this. After Catherine, we have another important czar. His name is Alexander I. When we talked about Napoleon or the Napoleonic Wars, we talked about how Alexander was the man that allied himself with Napoleon in the beginning during the Continental System. Uh, the Continental System tried to cut off England from all trade with the rest of the Europe. And so Alexander was one of the first people to join uh, the Continental System with France to try to isolate England. Eventually, he will betray Napoleon and actually start trading with England and go against the continental system, and this will precipitate the war in Russia. Uh, because of this, Napoleon will invade Russia, actually take over Moscow, but he will not defeat Russia. It will be his downfall. So Alexander is the czar of Russia who leads the Russian people through the Napoleonic Wars. After Alexander, uh, we have Nicholas I. Uh, Nicholas I comes to the throne after Alexander in 1825. Uh, just as he comes to the throne, there is a revolt against him. Uh, it's called the December Revolt, uh, or the Decemberist Revolt, where the people of Russia try to rise up against the Tsar and overthrow him. But that revolt is put down very quickly and it is unsuccessful. It is from the beginning of his reign that Nicholas is kind of paranoid and worried about people trying to overthrow him. That's because in the very early days of his reign, he was actually, uh, there was a revolution that was trying to overthrow him. Uh, it is during the reign of Nicholas I that, the, that Russia is involved in what's called the Crimean War. Uh, Russia wants to expand its borders into the Mediterranean Sea, and before it can do that, the way to reach the Mediterranean Sea is to take over the Black Sea. The Black Sea of this time is controlled by the Ottoman Empire, or Turkey, as it's known today, and Turkey is allied with England, France, and Spain, who don't want Russia to expand. And so, thus begins what's called the Crimean War, in which England, France, and uh, Turkey defeat Russia and keep it from gaining a foothold in the Black Sea, or more specifically, in the Crimean Peninsula, which is in the northern part of the Black Sea, where present-day Ukraine is. After Nicholas, we have Alexander II. Alexander II is remembered throughout history, especially Russian history, as the Tsar Liberator. He's remembered as this is because he gets rid of feudalism in Russia. Unlike Ivan IV, who brought feudalism, remember feudalism is a socioeconomic system that's based on the distribution of land. Uh, you know, it starts at the top with the king. He distributes the land amongst his lords or vassals. They distribute the land among uh, the lesser vassals and lords under them, and then the knights, and then the peasants, and the serfs, and so on. All right? And so what Alexander II does is he get, does away with the entire feudal system. Now, it's still going to take several years for the entire country to adjust, but he is remembered as being the man who officially frees the serfs from bondage. Uh, Russia is one of the last countries in Europe to actually use feudalism, and so when this happens, uh, the whole nation is kind of ready for it, and it kind of takes some of the pressure off of him from the people wanting to rise up against them. Now, that's all the notes that I have for you all today. 
If you haven't taken these notes down or haven't done the reading from pages 247 to 249, please pause the video now and make sure that you have all the notes written down, or you can do the reading on your own and the notes on your own, just the way that we would do it in class. Once you have finished that, remember that you do have some homework tonight. Your homework tonight will be the section review on page 349. It is 23.2, it'll look like this. Make sure you do all seven of the questions and go ahead and turn that in as soon as possible or as soon as you finish it, give it to your parents and make sure that they bring it into school. I hope you guys are having a great break. I hope you're staying safe and healthy and I hope you all have a great day. Stay on task and stay history.